Thank you. Thank you indeed. I respectfully would like to invite the court's attention to Article 93, was one of the constitution. First, I would state respectfully that even though the scan independence sets out three issues for consideration by the court, my respectful view is that the first issue that we set out for determination, <coughs> which is that whether or not plaintiffs should properly impose the of the court, has in effect been disposed of by the court in its ruling dated the last agenda date. If not, 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 not entirely. Right. Be, be assured that it will be fully addressed. Very well. Not, not entirely, yes. Well, but the point I make is that on account of the argument advanced in court on 30th October 2024, and the ruling dated 30th October 2024, we did not find it necessary this morning to go on with arguments under the first issue. And you did rely on the arguments with the last, last agenda. Respectfully. No, 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 no. You cannot proceed like that. You cannot proceed like that because the last agenda, this panel did not hear you. Right. This is right. the panel that's, that's hearing the substance. Yes, yes, yes. 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 An interpretation of the Constitution and an enforcement or an enforcement of the Constitution. Same is within the exclusive preserve of the Supreme Court. Article 2, Clause 1 makes this quite clear. And Article 130, Clause 1 reinforces it and indicates clearly that this principle is subject only to the, the High Court's jurisdiction in the enforcement of fundamental human rights. Article 130, Clause 1. The one, High Court's jurisdiction in an the, enforcement. In the enforcement of, of fundamental, fundamental human, human rights. And I chapter 5. Respectfully, even the formulation of Article 130, Clause 1 indicates that. Insofar as an issue of interpretation arises out of a construction of any of the fundamental human rights provision, same will even come within the exclusive jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. That's why. So even in the jurisdiction of the High Court on to fundamental enforce. human rights, to enforce. Should to enforce fundamental human rights, should there be a matter for interpretation, interpretation. that will come under the With jurisdiction the of, the of the Supreme Court? And I have as my authority the decision of the Supreme Court in the famous Nana J. Ampofo matter, which we have referred or cited in our similar case, an A. J. Ampofo versus Atendra. Again, it is reinforced by the decision of the court in Benema. Honorable Attorney General, yes, what you are telling us, is it not captured in your um, statement of case? Yes, so it is. It's, I'm, I'm only addressing the court because my Lord has thank indicated that the last agenda, it, those matters were actually not. I mean, yes, but this at, first time, this at, at, first at the time. moment we have your statement of case, all right? And that's, that's what we are supposed to consider. That's why. Good. Yes. So Mr. if Mr. it is captured in your statement of case, then you will spare us. Right. So I will then proceed to the second issue. And in, in addressing the court to the second issue, I'll refer the court to first Article 93, Clause 1 of the Constitution, which sets out the composition of Parliament. It says there shall be a Parliament which shall consist of not less than 140 elected members. This should be read as submitted respectfully with Article 47, Clause 1 of the Constitution. Which says Ghana shall be divided into as many constituencies for the purpose of election of members of parliament as the Federal Commission may prescribe. And each constituency shall be represented by one member of parliament. 
combined effect of these provisions is that insofar as parliament is constituted by a certain number of MPs or members of parliament representing those constituencies, the composition of parliament shall not be altered except as prescribed for in the constitution. So no person or authority with all respect has the power to make any decision at all or construe the constitution in a way which will alter or change the composition of parliament except as it is in the constitution. So I say that the point, the matters before the court, apart from the meaning of Article 97, Cross 1, Paragraph G and H, also have an effect on the composition of Parliament, as prescribed for by the Constitution. So I also further contend, respectfully, right. The combined effect of Articles 93.1 and 47.1 is that insofar as Parliament comprises, it, the com Parliament comprises of constituencies that set out in the Constitution, that composition cannot be altered except in compliance with constitutional directions. Precisely. That's the point made? Yes, just a little point. Comprises num members of Parliament representing the constituencies. Was Parliament that were composed of the members of Parliament? Not it. So I submit that the composition of Parliament can only be altered strictly in accordance with the Constitution. And no person or authority has the power to change Parliament as duly com 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 composed or constituted, except in accordance with the procedures known to the Constitution. But it's made the point that the matters in issue, with all respect, go beyond the mere meaning of Article 97, Clause 1, Paragraph J and H. They also have an effect on the composition of Parliament as anticipated by the Constitution. So respectfully, if a construction is placed on Article 97, Clause 1, Paragraphs G and H, with the result that the composition of Parliament is altered, and that construction is wrong, respectfully, I submit that the constitutional order of the country has been upset. If a construction is based on Articles 97, Clause 1, J, and H, 
the such construction is wrong. The respect the constitution of the country has been unlawfully upset. The second point I make respectfully is that everything in the Constitution, from the regulations affecting the performance of the Electoral Commission's functions, in Chapter 7, the composition of parliament or the, or the entire chapter on the legislature, the entire chapter on the legislature in chapter 10, shows that parliament when used refers, refers to a specific term. Hold on, the word, word parliament. Parliament, the word parliament, parliament when used. refers to only one term of parliament in session and nothing more. And that when the people of Ghana respectfully also elect a member of parliament, when the people of, of Ghana vote in the election of members of parliament, that election is for only one term. And they do not have in mind the election of members of parliament beyond the term of parliament for which they voted. Well, I refer to Article 113. Article 113, Clause 113, Clause 1 of the Constitution. And it says quickly, subject to Clause 2 of this article. Parliament shall continue for four years from the date of its setting, setting and shall then stand dissolved. Clause 2, respectfully, provides that at any time when Ghana is actually engaged in war, Parliament may from time to time, by resolution supported by the votes of not less than two thirds of four members of Parliament, extend a period of four years specified in Clause 1 of this article for not more than 12 months, except that the life of Parliament shall not be extended. So clearly, Parliament is for only four years and nothing more. My lady, this is further Excuse reinforced by... Excuse me. Excuse me. Can you turn to page 24 of your statement of case, please? Twenty-three and twenty-four. Oh, page twenty-three. Paragraph thirty-two and paragraph thirty-three. Yes. Is what you are saying there? Yes, Mr. Sophie, but I will further, I did not allude to clause 2 of Article 97, which I'm coming to. Respectfully, and clause 2 of Article 97 is very important. And so the, the point I make from all of this is that anything that affects the composition of parliament for a future parliament which has not yet been elected is unknown to the Constitution. The Constitution does not anticipate that all the matters set out in Article 97 Clause 1, including G and H, which are an issue before the court today, have any bearing on matters beyond the life of a current parliament. They have only consequences so far as the current parliament is, is concerned with. I respectfully, apart from the clear or the, or the indication in the language of Article 97, Clause G, which talks about a person seeking to remain in Parliament. I'll refer the court to Article 97, Clause 2, which has not featured so far in, in the argument for the court. Article 97, Clause 2 is in these terms. Notwithstanding Paragraph G or Clause 1 of this article, a measure of parties at the national level sanctioned by the party's constitutions or membership of a coalition government of which his original party forms part 
shall not affect the status of any member of parliament. So if the point being sought to be made from Article 97 or 2 is that even a major of political parties in the life of, 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 of any parliament has no effect whatsoever on the status of a member of parliament. Thus, if today the NDC and CPP, respectfully, come together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I don't want to see okay, sound. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but so I, I will be, I will prefer a merger between the MPP and CPP as occurred okay, in 1996. So respectfully, indeed, the implication is that if in the first parliament of Ghana, the MPP had elected to contest parliamentary elections, which we all know from history that they did not. And in the course of the life of that parliament, as actually occurred, a merger between CPP and MPP occurred. The status of a member of parliament standing the ticket of MPP as an MPP MP shall not be touched, shall not be affected by the constitution. So if indeed MPP and CPP had come by an arrangement, as they did actually in 1996, that for the LMB constituency, the MPP will not contest and the CPP rather will contest, which indeed was the case. But the MPP at that time already had a sitting member of parliament in the LMB constituency. And by virtue of that, had more or less ceded his interest or right to a CPP member. Respectfully, that would not necessarily result in a vacation of the seat of, 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 the, of the member of parliament. So if indeed, on account of clause 2 of Article 97, it has been decided that for consistencies already held by the MPP, for the purpose of the upcoming election, those candidates or those members of parliament shall contest on a ticket of CPP or a different political party. Article 97 clause 2 suggests clearly that the status of such members of parliament as MPs shall not be altered. So it's probably this, in my respectful view, fortifies the proposition we make that any decision by a member of parliament to change his political identity for an upcoming election shall not necessarily result in a vacation of that member of parliament seat. I don't know if I'm making myself job. I'm moving. <laughs> so, right. So, apart from that, I'll refer the court to Article 47, Clause 5 of the Constitution, which is also a further indication. 47, Clauses 5 and 6 of the Constitution, which talks about alteration of the borders or boundaries of constituencies. So the point is that the constitution, as I indicated, anticipates that the change in the composition of parliament or the change in an anticipated composition of parliament in the future shall have no effect presently. And that's supported by Article 47 Clause 5, which vests the electoral commission with the power to review the divisions of of, of Ghana into constituencies at intervals of not less than seven years. Especially as we stand before the court. Indeed, the number of constituencies for the upcoming 24 elections has been altered by the Electoral Commission. Rather than 275 constituencies, we will have 276 constituencies in the December 2024 elections. Because of the alteration of the boundaries of, of the Boehm constituency, with the result that there has been the case of a new constituency for what we call the South people. The Santo Santo Kofi, uh, Santo Kofi, Lolobi, and Adbafu area. Clearly, the alteration of the boundaries of the existing Boem constituency now has not affected the status of a member of parliament sitting as MP in the Boem constituency. That alteration only has effect in the December 2024 elections. So the point I'm making with respect to that, it is so clear from the constitution that whenever a member of parliament decides to change his political identity, or indeed the constitution itself seeks to enforce 
a change in the composition of parliament for the next election. It has no effect in the current term. If that were the case, presently, the South people would vote now and elect their MP. But they cannot vote now and elect their MP. They must wait until December 2024. I'll quickly wrap up with a swift address of issue three, which is whether or not the declaration by the Speaker of Parliament of four vacancies. I have a question. Right. And my question is what is the point? of the provision in Article 971 GH. Why did the framers of the Constitution put them there? Right. Right. I so, know you have addressed it in yes. your, if, if, you, if you don't mind. I know you have addressed it in your submissions, but I think that by reason of the last point made regarding Article 47.5, we need to have some light shed on, on it. So if the, the purport of Article 971 and G is to prevent situations where a person in the life of a current parliament seeks to alter his political identity. That is found upon by the Constitution. So that if a person comes to parliament or having been elected as a member of parliament for a specific term as an MPP candidate or whatever political party candidate, in the course of the term of that parliament, which is to move to a different political party, the constitution says that's prohibited. If the person also seeks to continue, and that's, that's indicated by the use of the word, seeks to remain in parliament, if the person seeks to continue his tenure as an MP during that term of parliament as an independent candidate, that's prohibited by the constitution. Am I Indeed, such situations have occurred in this country. It is not without history or antecedent. So clearly, the Constitution anticipated a change of one's political identity within the term of the current parliament, and not an anticipation. Mr. Adami, can you give us one or two instances where such occurred? Exactly. Historical antecedent. Right. Especially in the first parliament of Ghana, there were about three or four instances whereby whereby so you, my Lord, in the first parliament there were three or four no the first parliament 1960 and the 1960 um, 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 constitution there were four instances in which some members of parliament cross carpet or change their political identity. There were the cases of J.A. Primer, Mumu Nibaumia, Tampuri, and the, the Tolona. They cross carpet from the then government CBP to join a different political party. Others also cross carpet from the opposition party to the government CBP. In view of that, the, and the court would note that the 19 state constitution had no such provisions at all. In view of that, for the very first time in 1969, a provision to that effect was, was enacted. And I refer the court to Article. Article, 19, Article 75, Clause 2, Paragraph G of the 1969 Constitution. That's what it was introduced. It says every, every member of the National Assembly shall vacate his seat in the Assembly upon the use of the National Assembly. A member of the National Assembly shall vacate his seat in the Assembly if G, he leaves the party of which was a member at the time of his election to the National Assembly to join another party. This was the first time the Second Republic that a provision like that, that was, in, was introduced. The provision again was repeated in 1979 Constitution, and it was at Article 
79. Article 79, paragraph I of the 1979 Constitution. I. I. It says, a member of parliament shall vacate his seat in parliament in I. If he leaves the party of which he was a member at the time of his election to join parliament, to join another party. Under party. At the time of his election, to join another party. So that's it. Then the provision was repeated in 1982. When the 1982 provision constitution took effect, a situation like that occurred. And I refer the court to the circumstance of Alaji Wario Saini, Professor Wario Saini, who crossed carpet from the party on the ticket of which he had elected as member of parliament to join another political party. At that time, the Speaker of Parliament indeed rightly ruled that he had vacated his seat. Especially, this situation that we find ourselves in before the had again occurred in Parliament, in the Seventh Parliament. The Speaker of Parliament, just like the current Speaker, ruled that had vacated his seat. My that that such ruling was erroneous. The ruling that affected the status of Honorable Isiama um, uh, Maridi, I, 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 I love because the gentleman has suffered a lot. The last parliament he was declared to have been, to, to, to have vacated his seat. This parliament again, to, his seat has been vacated. One person. He suffered a lot. <laughs> so, my lady, and my point is that no matter the number of times an unconstitutional act is repeated, it has not ripened into constitutionality. This court has said in numerous cases. So you are wrong in that. Yes, this court has said in numerous cases. It started from before the Tangera up to um, the recent matter, and the expertise charge or so. Yes, expertise charge. Like 2007-2008, Supreme Court of Ghana report, Volume One, at page. Two, one, three. That an unconstitutional act, no matter the times, no, no matter the times repeated, respectfully, does not ripen into over, into, into constitutionality. So the fact that the previous speaker had ruled that Mr. Isema Mwaku had vacated the seat, and that is being sought to be used as a precedent today, does not mean that it's constitutional. Respectfully. I will, I will, be, I will be done on, on, on this case. You, you this had only three issues. Yes. And you have addressed them. Yeah. Well, I say that the court has the power to issue orders and that, and the orders and directions issued by the court shall be binding on anybody at all. Expertise judge held the same. Republic versus High Court, First Trial Division, Accra. Expertise Commission of Human Rights and Fitting Justice, which is an interested party. The court held at page 296, per Georgina Wood, CJ, that in relation to this matter, I think this was that a that a GSE, that a bad GSE stated that in relation to this matter, we need to remind ourselves that there is no parliamentary supremacy under our constitution. Rather, it is a constitution that is supreme. As the interpreter of that constitution, this court's view of the meaning of a constitutional provision cannot be preempted, cannot be preempted by that of any other agency of the state. In short, a provision in the constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means, and not what even Parliament has declared it means. I end on this note. The Supreme Court's power to interpret the constitution has been long appealed from Benjamin Awuno Williams, 1970, over 54 years ago, up to date. The constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means. End of matter. Thank you very much.